people who watch my videos will see that will know that I really focus a lot on that symbolism. Like the, I tend to go back to the first chapters of Genesis as kind of like the the pattern making. You can imagine it almost like as if the the, the Bible has this first part, which is really this enunciation of the patterns. It's almost like a it's almost like a fugue, you know, like a Bach like a Bach fugue where you have the theme which is announced at the beginning. Then you have like a, a kind of variation on the themes which which appears all through scripture where they're repeated, you know, set against each other. There's this play interplay of the of the pattern. It kind of opens up, and then at the end in Revelation, it's restated in a in a higher at a higher level where the first image of the garden is now mm -hmm. the last image of the garden with the city and this kind of glorious moment where everything comes together and death is destroyed and you know all the all the problems that were set about in the first chapter are 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 kind of uh kind of resolved so that's so interesting because i'm reading through echoes of exodus uh, by alistair roberts and he starts out right at the very beginning saying we need to read the scripture musically mm, and yep. he has like his beginning chapter man uh, is just absolutely fantastic where like you said it's like he, he, you take all of these different elements of music uh, and you look at the motif and melody and how those play out. And that's really what's happening in the written form or a linguistic form in the biblical text. And in yeah, well, the ancients, when they use the word music. So, for example, if you look at the, the classic, uh, the classical uh, curriculum, one of the elements was music. And so you would think that music just meant singing or it just meant learning to play an instrument. But. It, it does, it's not clear that that's what it meant. It seems to mean a lot more. You know, when we talk about the music of the spheres, for example, like in a Pythagorean sense, then we're actually not just talking about sound in the sense of what you hear, but it's actually the perception of pattern. And so music, that's, it's almost like pure pattern. That's what music is. You know, it's, it's one of the closest things to a mathematical formula that you can experience is, is to recognize amongst abstract sounds a pattern. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. The way that Neil said it in our conversation was that music presents reality or it presents that which is beyond our five senses. Yeah, that's what, for sure, that's what it does. And it does it, and there's something, there's a priority of, of sound in scripture. Uh, and I think that it's probably not just in scripture. It, it might be a universal thing because sound is invisible and it, it is, it's experienced the causality of sound is not easy to perceive right so you when you see something you can see it like happening right and so the the, the causality is there in front of you but sound kind of drops in you know from above let's say and it's carried by wind and it's carried by by spirit basically and uh, and it also comes from the person's mouth so it, 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 and it carries meaning directly. And so the idea of, of sound and singing, let's say, as being the primordial language is something that you find in many cultures. You know, you find, you find that in, in uh, there's a lot of, uh, of early kind of mythological type texts that will talk about, you know, singing as the, the, you know, the song, the world was sung into being or that, you know, the idea of the language of the angels, for example, is like the language of the birds. And it's and it's this uh, this singing that comes from that comes from the heavens. Wow. Okay. So that's so interesting, because what Roberts is is laying out in his book Echoes of Exodus is that you take like certain elements like uh, say meter and rhythm, and with meter that would it, it, phenomenologically or in the course of a regular day that would be like one day after next turns into a week turns into a month. It's very consistent. It's very steady. It's calculated. But then you have rhythm where say you have like holidays and birthdays and festivals and Thanksgiving and Easter and et cetera. And that creates like a rhythm, right? But then within that, whenever we sit down and have a meal or if we have Eucharistic communion and we remember we're tying, it, it, it transcends that day meter regular rhythm or excuse me, that regular meter, and you're able to tie and connect several generations back, 2,000 years back. And also, 
know that you're going to be tying with people in the future. So whenever you sit down to Thanksgiving, you have this remembrance that transcends time, at least. Am I off yeah, with that? Yeah, that's or? The, the whole structure of eschatology in Christianity. It has a metaphysical function. People just think that that it's all about just what's going to happen in the future, but it, it that's not really what's going on in Christian eschatology or in eschatology in general, not just Christian eschatology, because most most religions have an eschatology. Um, it's mostly about what you're saying. It's about the idea of, on the one hand, remembering the past, but also remembering the future. Uh, and and we're not used to thinking of thinking it that way. But you mm-hmm. need to understand memory simply as distance from something. And so you can have you can have distance. And so, for example, like if I remember my wife, it doesn't mean that she's still not around. It's not about the past; it's just about distance. You know, she could be in my house, and I can remember her because she's just not with me at the moment. And so, you can remember the future as well. And so, that moment of memory, uh, the liturgical moment, or like you said, the Eucharistic moment, becomes this thing that transcends time, or 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 compresses time into a point of participation, which is both remembering, let's say, the bo- the body of Christ, which was given, you know, on the cross, but it's also remembering the the last judgment, remembering the final resolution of the whole story when we are all together, you know, when, when all has been revealed and everything is in communion, you know, uh, and even in the Orthodox liturgy, we say that we think it's it's interesting because there's a moment just before very close to the actual communion moment where we thank God for things. And we say, we thank God for the, it's, it's like the, the, the birth, the, the life, the death, the resurrection of the dead, the ascending into heaven, the sitting on the right hand of the father and the final last and final judgment. And we thank God for something as if it's something that's happened, but we're thanking him for the, for the final judgment, which is still to come. And so it's like you said, this moment of, of, not just memory, but gratefulness for the things that, you know, the, the things that are before, the things that are coming. And so that is this amazing possibility of, uh, of ritual and of, of, the, of communion. Yeah, um, it's like the grand crescendo. It's kind of like... Yeah, exactly. Um, so like uh, if you look at the de- deliverance in the stories of Exodus and with Moses and the people going out of uh, Egypt and into the promised land eventually you see those being repeated or echoed during the life of Christ or in several stories in between. But then it's not like it's complete there because even at that moment, it, like you said, it points to uh, call it the grand overture or the grand conclusion that's still yet to come. And even then that end is still just a beginning of something even grander to come. Yeah. And that's what it kind of, like when it feels like when you read St. Gregory of Nyssa, he really talks about theosis when the way that he talks about deification is not a status. We tend to think of, of, a, of a, let's say heaven or, you know, paradise as kind of the static joining, you know, you, it's like you're in, you see it in the, the caricature. It's like you sit in, sit on a cloud with a, with a harp and it's like, okay, you're there, you know, what are you going to do now? But rather the, the image that St. Gregory gives. And I think something someone like St. Louis, uh, uh, St. Louis, C.S. Lewis. Hey, it was quite the slip. Someone like C.S. Lewis, <laughs> C.S. Lewis uh, says it's like this. It's actually a kind of infinite entering or an infinite uh, dynamic process. You know, where you you actually join with God, and it becomes this kind of infinite dynamic process of of entering into God. So. Yeah.